TFM. Welcome, boomers, to another episode of Warp Five, our dedicated Enterprise podcast. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host Matthew Rushing. And Matthew, just say when. When? Okay, so you're going for the just the small indulgence tonight, I guess. Here, you know, we don't drink wine very often on the show, but. No, but I do love it. Uh, I love a good glass of of red wine, especially. And uh, it's nice to see, you know, that uh, Captain Archer and Trip can also appreciate the finer things in life, you know, instead of of beer and peanuts. (laughs) And uh, it's also nice to know that, you know, every once in a while, Vulcans will indulge themselves in a inebriating beverage. I always wonder, though, is it? Like, uh, you know, what they portrayed in the Lord of the Rings movies where when you get Legolas drinking and it doesn't really affect him until like 45 drinks in, <laughs> is a Vulcan like that too, you know? Um, so, it yeah, just, I, I, I've always wondered that. Yeah, it could be. It could be. But uh, at least you get a wonderful story out of it. All right, enough of this. Let's get on with the discussion here. We're going to continue our 20th anniversary look at Star Trek Enterprise with the second episode of Season 2, Carbon Creek. Here is a quick rundown of the story. To mark the one-year anniversary of T'Pol's official commission as a member of the Enterprise crew, Captain Archer invites her to dinner along with Trip. It is a special occasion indeed, as the previous record for a Vulcan serving with a human crew was a mere ten days. When Archer asks her about a trip she once made to a small mining town called Carbon Creek, she agrees to tell them a story. I mean, who hasn't spun an intriguing yarn with a little wine in their system? She recounts the experiences of her second foremother, Tamir, after the Vulcan survey mission of which she was a part crash-landed in Pennsylvania. It's a tale of Velcro, higher education, and I love Lucy. But did it really happen? So, Matthew, that's the big question. Let's just get it out of the way up front. Do you think it really happened? You know, I think it did. Um, I I think... You know, they they tip their hand at the end of the episode when she pulls out the bag. And what makes it great, too, is that, you know, this is a very personal story for T'Pol. You know, it has to do with her family and their connection with the humans and, you know, something that most humans would have no idea of unless they were studying the Vulcan archives uh, for research missions. Because for them, this was just another research mission on a planet in the general vicinity of Vulcan, I don't. I have no idea how. I, I've never looked up how far Vulcan is supposed to be from Earth, but yeah, I, I I've always believed, of course, that yes, this this is something that actually happened. Were you on the same wavelength with that? Did did you feel like this story was something that had always happened? Maybe not necessarily in the way that we see it, but that it had happened. Yes. Now, if I go back to the initial viewing, as I was watching the story unfold, I wasn't sure. I thought that, yeah, it's likely that this could have happened, but maybe T'Pol really is just pulling their leg. Mm -hmm. But as you say at the end, she pulls out the bag, and I remember watching it the first time and thinking that was a really nice touch creatively Mm -hmm. to have her have that bag. Now, it does raise all kinds of questions, which maybe we should just talk about now, even though I put this near the end of our outline. If T'Pol has that bag with her on the NX-01, it must be a very valuable heirloom to her. It must have some real meaning to her. So I'm going to assume that she maybe knew her... I don't know. Do you think I'm going to assume she knew her second foremother? So in real English, in plain English, this would be your great, great grandmother. 
Uh, I knew my great grandmother for many years, actually, all the way up until I was uh, in high school, and or maybe even the end of that into the beginning of university. And I didn't know my great great grandmother, of course, but Vulcans being so long lived, perhaps they did. But even if she didn't, I imagine she knew her great-grandmother. So this heirloom has been passed down, so she would probably know the stories. And you would expect that an experience like this and the fact that her second foremother was going on these survey missions would imply that there's this curiosity about other worlds or other races or species running through the family. And the fact that there's this story of her ancestor having spent time on Earth would make me think that T'Pol might be one of those Vulcans who has this curiosity about humans. And yet, from the setup of Broken Bow, she really had a disdain for humans. And it's only spending time with the Enterprise crew over the past year that she has kind of opened up and become a little bit more interested than in them. But at this point, she's still quite standoffish. So if you really think about the story uh, uh, beyond the superficial level of the story, which is quite fun and delightful, that feels a little bit odd for the character to me. And how, how do you feel about that? Um, you know, I think one of the things I, I saw in this episode that maybe I hadn't seen before uh, as I was watching it, for our recording, I th- I think this this episode is really a one in which gives us a taste of where we're going to go with the character of T'Pol in the sense of, um, you know, we see her great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother become invested in humanity because of a very meaningful story, one that she can get behind which is the education of this boy who has had an impact on her life and uh, she didn't expect to have that impact you know and 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 I think it's a mirroring of what is happening to to Paul herself you know we already saw in season two episode one shockwave part two where she comes to the defense of humans and and of course, as you mentioned, that's obviously something that would never have happened at the beginning of the series. And, you know, she's changed in her view of humanity, uh, in her relationship with humanity. I mean, she at the beginning of the series, she would have never been sitting at this dinner with Captain Archer and accept wine mm-hmm. from him. Yeah, yeah. She would have never been that, quote unquote, relaxed. And so I, I think. What's great about the episode is it does a fantastic job of of giving us a picture, I think, of where this character is going to go in relation to humanity, the same way her her great-great-grandmother did. And I think that that's actually a really neat way to to give us that. Also, I I think what it, it helps us do is... You know, we've been with this character for a year, and it does help us to be able to reflect on how much to Paul herself has changed. And so I'm I'm guessing it seems interesting to me that yes, that she would have this with her. But I'm guessing that, you know, to Paul seems like the character who there might be some sentimentality in her and that she might carry with her a small memento box of important things for her family as she's, you know, moving. She's been on Earth. We suspect she's probably been on different ships before so that wherever she goes, uh, she has this with her. So, you know, to me that it's not too much of a leap. Um, More than anything, I just I appreciate, I think, the episode for what it's doing for the character to Paul, actually, even though. It's not a story about her. It's a story about her ancestor. Yeah, that's a great point. You mentioned Memento Box there. And I just thought about one. I think it was the orb. We did the top 10. And you said you keep a, mm-hmm. a box of, of oh. mementos for your favorite yeah. episodes. <laughs> it just came flashing <laughs> it's, it's, uh, to me. It's Paul's hope chest. <laughs> <laughs> but what you say here is it's great. And 
it's something that I haven't really thought about much before. The fact that, yeah, it mirrors the experience of T'Pol's great-great-grandmother on Earth and then T'Pol's experience on the Enterprise in that they both arrive in a situation with humans where they don't want to be there, they're concerned, standoffish. Uh, In the case of Tamir, she doesn't want to pollute this alien world, I guess she wants to stay Mm -hmm. out of the fray, but also she sees these people as primitive. And in T'Pol's case, she doesn't want to have to serve with humans and she sees humans as a bit primitive. But then both of them warm up to humans and both of them begin to help. In the case of Tamir, ultimately helping Jack get money for college and then also understanding Mestral's desire to stay behind, for example. Mm -hmm. And then we, on the show here, story by story, are seeing how T'Pol warms up to everyone. That's a great way of mirroring that and doing so with the same actress. I've, I've seen some people who feel like Jolene plays this, plays the two characters in a way that's too similar, like Tamir is to Paul. But I always felt like that was part of the point of the story. And it's also not mm-hmm. surprising that uh, two people related like that might come across similarly. But even more importantly, right. setting up the mirroring that you just talked about, having the same person playing both characters and giving them both the same demeanor, same attitudes, same uh, speech patterns, and everything reinforces that that idea. Yeah, I, I, I think I love her performance in, in the episode because... I mean, it does feel as though, I mean, she she's an interesting combination between uh, Strawn and Mistral. Uh, you know, she's, she's not uninterested, but I think more than anything, she feels the weight of being, I think, in charge. Yeah. Um, you know, she's, she's not the captain, but she's made the captain in the end because of who died and therefore... She has the responsibility then of bringing these people home if if possible and doing the classic Star Trek thing, which is to not contaminate this world, right? Um, you know, all of those things are, are highly important to uh, Star Trek uh, characters, uh, especially Vulcans. And so, you know, I think... She does a wonderful job of, of playing this character, and, and I really enjoy the way that she plays the character. I think it's a it's a lot of fun, and I, I think part of it is that she does a great job of just reacting, especially to Mistral as a character, and I think it really it works well. And you know, who knew that T'Pol would look so nice in uh, and or her her. Uh, great great grandmother in 1950s clothing you know all these vulcans <laughs> look really good in 1950s clothing uh so they do they could all get jobs as fashion models on uh, <laughs> yes. 1950s yes. or i think it would work well <laughs> all right let's uh talk about okay actually while we're talking about the clothing let's just talk about the situations because This episode is a little bit, and I think it's fun for this, but it's a little bit of a grab bag of Star Trek's greatest time travel hits in terms of the situations that characters find themselves in. And with the clothing, it very much mirrors the original series where they're having to Mm -hmm. take clothes off the clothesline and get dressed and... Then you also have the other moments like, oh, they need money. It's yes. like the yep. voyage home. There are so many of these situations. What did he mean by exact change? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but what did you think about these situations and the fact that so many of them were familiar? Did you feel like this was a point where Star Trek had done this type of story so many times that 
all they could do was recycle the ideas in a different way? Or did you enjoy seeing it and it brought together yet another interesting and fresh story for you? Mm -hmm. You know, I I think one of the things that this does well uh, is that helps us realize, you know, if you if you're something like this happens to you, uh, a lot of the the experiences that would happen would be very similar. You're going to have to find some sort of disguise. You know, you're going to have to find some sort of way to get currency in all of these different things. And I thought that this uh, did a great job of being similar and yet different enough, especially loved the, the idea of, and, and I think it's just such a fun experience to watch a Vulcan hustle a human at pool. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, that's that's a really enjoyable thing to to watch in the episode. And so that's the place where I, I feel like they did a good job of creating things in this story uh, that are different. And I think, too, what makes this really interesting is that this is a story about Vulcans being stuck on Earth at a and and we already know from Enterprise that Vulcans can be very prickly about human beings in the first place. Mm-hmm. And this just accentuates that and helps reinforce that fact. That Vulcans, for the most part, they tend to be people who like to study things from afar. Yeah. Until they believe that species is ready. And so very much here, that's, you know, what we get, you know, when Mr. Alt wants to stay and they're like, why? And he's like, because I can't get this type of study from high orbit scans. Right. (laughs) You know, and so that's the reason that he gave that they would buy. The real reason is that there were too many TV cliffhangers coming up that he didn't want to miss if he left the planet. True. He really needed to see what (laughs) happened on I love Lucy next, which is uh, totally understandable. Um, uh, so, but I, you know, I, I just, I think that that's what it helps show to here is that Vulcans aren't a monolith. Yeah. They're not a monoculture, you know, that there is variation uh, in them, and I think that's actually really smart in this episode. That's something that's really great is that they begin to show us the differences in in, in Vulcans because so far, um, except for DePaul, they've all kind of come off as the same. But here in this episode, we we begin to see is that that's not the case. Not only is DePaul herself changing, which this episode helps reinforce, but we've seen that other Vulcans are more amenable to having these type of experiences than others might be. And so I think in the end, it, it's an episode that works on a lot of different levels for what it's doing for uh, the Vulcan people and and not just even the character of uh, to Paul. So I, I think in, in all of that, it's great. I th- it's a really smart and, and kind of a fun episode. And, and you know, I think we come off of the big cliffhanger and then this is kind of a nice like, yeah. oh, I can breathe episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, this is not a bottle episode and this episode probably actually cost them quite a bit of money because they went and filmed on location. Yeah. Um, not in Pennsylvania, not in Pennsylvania but they did go yeah. and Yeah, but they <laughs> did go and film on location. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, this is the type of episode that, yeah, it feels like, you know, something that's kind of innocuous, but really, I mean, they're putting a lot into this. Uh, so I love that, you know, and it shows in the episode. I think everything that they do on location looks fantastic. I think they did a, a great job of, of making this feel I mean, if you had tried to do all this in the soundstage or in the back lot, it just wouldn't have worked. So I, I, I got to give them props. They're like, yeah, they, they put their heart and soul into this episode and they put a lot of dollars into it too, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't shot in Pennsylvania. It was shot in Crestline, California. Uh, like so much of everything on television, it looks like California. But as you say, that does take more money to go out and actually do that. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the fact that it comes after 
the the big shockwave conclusion because it mirrors what they've done in the past in a few cases. In TNG, we had family after the best of both worlds, which gives mm-hmm. us that chance to decompress. And then we have here a chance to breathe again, and we'll have that again later on in the series with Home. And mm-hmm. I, I do like that return to a more quiet character setting after we have these big productions and and cliffhangers or life-threatening events mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the other thing and and one of the, the, the neat things uh, about the situation is watching especially Mistral and Tamir begin to have feelings for the humans um, and and want to be a part of their lives because they find them interesting. Um, and not only to be a part of their lives, but to impact them. You know, uh, what, what I love the beauty of Mistral saying that he has compassion for the humans. That uh, the ability to save their lives means something to him. And I think what's really neat about that, and I was just thinking about this as we we're having this discussion, and it's not something that had come with the episode, but it's like to get outside of our box and to see other people as beings that deserve to be respected, that deserve to be treated as as people with worth and with value and that um you know if we can do something to help them well we should because they are people of worth and value and 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 it it's always one of those things where that's the the crux of the frustration sometimes with the prime directive right <laughs> is that we feel like really is it is it the most loving thing to not help somebody if you can help them you know so i i just love that we're kind of again having a prime directive type of episode but it's really an episode about learning to see people differently instead of just painting with a broad brush because yes yeah. if you looked on the if you look on the surface yes we just looked like a species that was going to destroy ourselves and it's when you begin to know individuals that you begin to see no they're 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 very different they're they have potential so i think all of that just really is something that still speaks volumes in today's society yeah yeah and it's great for them to show that in here after like you said the vulcans that we've seen up to this point in the first season, yeah, it's a good point. We were mostly in the first season. We're seeing like the upper echelons of command, or the ambassador, but the ambassador carrying the banner for what the upper echelons mm-hmm. of the high command wants. And here we're seeing more like the people actually serving. And yes. the diversity and how they think, which mirrors real life because governments have their positions, military leaders have their positions, but the people working at the mid-levels, the soldiers in the military and such, they don't all, It's they're not a monolith, right, in how they view mm-hmm. what's going on. And yeah. they're carrying out a duty that they have sworn to carry out, but uh, they're not a monolith. And the Vulcans are often portrayed that way in Enterprise from the beginning in order to set up this conflict, which was necessary to push humans out into space and to give us some drama because Mm -hmm. it is a television show. And also, as I think you and I have talked about before, here on The Ready Room, other places where we've talked about Vulcans, it's necessary for them to do this in Enterprise so that they can actually evolve the Vulcans and make them interesting and use the Vulcans to tell a story of humanity's journey, 
which is what science mm-hmm. fiction does, because if you create mm-hmm. cardboard yep. two-dimensional alien species, which is what Star Trek has historically done most of the time, you can't tell that story effectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're 100% right. And in many ways, I think it's one of those things where we can absolutely see that they were taking uh, the more Star Trek Deep Space Nine approach uh, to storytelling with working to make sure that the aliens that we depict here are more interesting and more worth watching than previously had had been seen and so yeah i i think that's fantastic and and like you said you know they then can show us things about ourselves which is the what star trek is supposed to do like you know that that's what that's what makes you know star trek star trek is is it was specifically science fiction that was meant to speak to who we are now and where we want to go and i think you know that's what obviously the best science fiction has done for generations so yeah well let's talk about the timeline and canon and such for a little bit because the other thing that this episode does and it's easier to put it in its place in the the timey-wimey history of the Federation and life on Earth and the universe and everything now with other stories that we've gotten. But rewinding to when this first aired, everyone remembered the film First Contact. Everyone remembered how humans and Vulcans met for the first time. And then this rewrites that history. And that's sort of the core of the whole conversation that's happening at the dinner table with Archer, Trip, and T'Pol is that Archer and Trip can't believe that that this really happened and that history is not what they've always been taught that it was. So they're sitting there and T'Pol's telling them this story. And there was this moment where it reminded me of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because Archer says, why would they keep this a secret? Why wouldn't they tell anybody? And T'Pol says, well, you know, it's, it's very well documented. She said the incident is well documented at the science directorate oh, yeah. and the space council. <laughs> and then in my head, I immediately heard in the bottom of a locked filing cabinet stuck in a disused lavatory with a sign on the door saying, beware of the leopard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then to, and then yes. and then Trip says on Vulcan and that's just like you know the plans they've been on mm-hmm. display on Alpha Centauri. Yes. And yes. you can't even be bothered to go look at them. I yeah as you're saying that I was I was I was thinking of that scene for the book <laughs> as well and I, what I what I also think is so great about this is that we only know of history what what's been written about it, right? And so, yeah, when when you have them say, this is like, you know, finding out Neil Armstrong wasn't the first person to walk on the moon. And maybe she's like, he wasn't. <laughs> maybe he wasn't. And they're like, oh, my gosh. You know, like it, there's there's probably so many things that have happened in our history uh, that that would give us a whole different flavor if we knew them. Yeah. Right. And and so. Well, at best, our history books from. Mm-hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years ago in particular yep. have to be quite inaccurate just because of the way the information was recorded and and who wrote the books and you know we weren't recording everything on the video as we are now so mm-hmm. we don't we, we we don't know yeah i mean i don't i don't i wouldn't agree with that because i don't think i think most uh as well, human beings are very good at recording information, but it. I'm just saying I think that, uh, and especially uh, even ancient civilizations, they're very good at work. They're recording a lot of stuff, but it's just that what we can find, yeah, all that kind of stuff really I think more comes into uh, the thought process for me is that, I mean, there's there's so much that happened. There's and there's been so much that's been lost too. Well, that's, to, to time yeah, and that's sort and of that my point kind of, thing. of details yeah. of of yeah the accuracies of some of the stories. Yeah, and so 
in all of that, I just I I loved that, and I thought it was it was very fun for the episode to uh, kind of uh, go there. And and again, what I think this does is that yes, officially Vulcans and humans met at first contact. Unofficially, well, you know, at least as far as we know, um, because. It, First contact is is when all of humanity learns that, you know, very – and well, not all of humanity, but very quickly after that, all of humanity learns is that we're not alone in the universe, whereas this is not that place, you know. Uh, there were – and we know from Star Trek that there is plenty of alien encounters yes. before – uh, you know, uh, from Little Green Men and other places. Well, going all the you way know. back to ancient Greece with, you know, who mourns exactly. for Adonais on I mean, the original goodness. series. So uh, aliens have been so, here many, many times. <laughs> they have <laughs> very many times. So I think that's all something that we have to take into account as well. And so I think this fits very nicely within the framework which Star Trek had already built for itself, which is to say – Oh, you think you know right. what happened, yeah. Yeah. and now we're going to and and I think that's that makes again that that's that's fun storytelling. Mm-hmm. So you know, if any fan kind of again has a an issue with that, I, I feel like in many ways I feel like you just haven't been paying attention to Star Trek because it's been doing it the whole time. You know, yeah. since so, since the beginning. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many people, especially today, are bothered by it, but I do remember at the time that there were fans that were quite upset. Like, how how could this happen? We know what happened. They landed in Montana, right? Which, again, right. <laughs> that's that's uh, it. It is a well, and being too much of a stickler for yeah. continuity like that, I think, takes the mm-hmm. fun out of being a fan of mm-hmm. a fictional universe. Yeah. And I, I so just as an interesting example, I, I think that there's a a. a a slight difference between something like this and then say something like all of the first two seasons of discovery, which felt very interesting when you were trying to kind of put them into the time period they are in Mm -hmm. and adding so many interestingly new things that we've never seen. And of course we just, it gets said that it's all classified and whatever, but that that's, that's a harder thing to buy i i would say than this which is it feels very similar to all of the things that we've done previously in star trek yeah so and there's that older novel called strangers from the sky which yeah. is yep. also yep. a story of mm-hmm. vulcan and human yes. encounters which mm-hmm. in some respects contradicts, you know, what they told in First Contact. And I remember when the film First right. Contact came out and I thought, okay, this is really interesting. And there's also this existing story of how First Contact happened between human and Vulcans from the novel right. Strangers from the Sky. And that's just how storytelling evolves. And, and of course, especially at that time, the books were very much not considered even part of head oh, yeah, canon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Much yeah. less actual yeah. canon. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, one other thing I wanted to point out here before we head into final thoughts is the fact that Star Trek paid homage to its origins in this episode with the I Love Lucy reference, which we already mentioned in our discussion today. Now, diehard fans and older fans of course, know this already, it's very well known, but newer fans of the franchise may not be aware that it was Lucille Ball and Desi Lu Studios who enabled Star Trek to actually exist in the 60s when Gene Roddenberry was getting it off the ground. And if you watch the original series, certainly the videotape and the dvds and i don't know if they've dropped it now on streaming on paramount plus or not but it always had the desi lu logo at the end Mm -hmm. and that's the reason that mr all says i love lucy is on tonight it was just a small little homage and thank you to lucille ball and i loved that they put that in the episode yeah i think that's the kind of thing that is just really smart 
you know, you have the opportunity to to say thank you uh, in, in a very small way. And, and like you said, just to, yeah, this is, this person in this series was actually somebody that um, made this possible. And so uh, just a great idea. And, you know, Enterprise could have been people's first Star Trek show. They may not even know that. You know, yeah. so to them, it's just a fun uh, cultural reference and right. touch point of where they are. But, yeah, for those longtime fans who who knew that, I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're getting new fans in the franchise all the time. And some yeah. of them are starting with Enterprise. Mm-hmm. You never know which series someone well, might start with. Interestingly enough, as, as we uh, were starting to record, uh, I was looking at our podcast on apple podcast and somebody's very first star trek series they've only seen two episodes of star trek and it is strange new worlds yeah so and they'd given us a review on apple podcast you know so yeah i mean you you got to remember there are new fans being created all the time absolutely all right well what are your final thoughts on carbon creek matthew and what's your rating for this one I just really like this episode. Um, I do like this, the quieter nature of the show. I love what it does for the character of T'Pol um, I, uh, and giving, giving us an understanding of her history, which I think is really fun. And I also really enjoy uh, just the opportunity to kind of see a new side of Vulcans. Uh, and I also really like the way in which we are developing the relationship between the main three characters of Enterprise. I think what's fascinating about this is when I think about what's going to happen later with the characters of T'Pol and Trip, you know, he knows a lot about her personally more than anybody else on the series. And now that continues, right? She's she's kind of told the story that to, to him and to Archer, which allows them to know her better, um, which I think is really cool that we have that opportunity. And so all in all, I just, I adore this episode. I think it's fantastic. It's absolutely one that I feel like is so easy to just kind of go back and rewatch over and over again, because it's just such a fun story. And so I give this episode four and a half out of five coal mining cave-ins wow that's got to be one of the most interesting rating (laughs) metrics that we've ever had (laughs) on trek (laughs) fm all right yeah i this has always been one of my favorite episodes since the day that it aired it's that kind of light fun story like you just said it's easy to rewatch it adds texture to the universe. It helps build character. And I mentioned that it's like a grab bag of Star Trek's greatest time travel hits. But I, I like that because I, I enjoy those moments. And I think it's fun when writers reuse them. And you even get the Wharf Troy one in here when Miss Droll gives the kiss and says that was pleasant. And Maggie says, mm-hmm. I've spent a long time since I've kissed anyone but i was hoping it would be more than pleasant and mr all says i did say very pleasant (laughs) so i just love all those little uh moments so i think it's a wonderful story and i'm gonna give it nine stooges haircuts nice fantastic All right, everyone, we would love to hear your thoughts on Carbon Creek. There are many ways for you to share those with us. Perhaps the best way is to join the Babel Conference on Facebook. That is our listeners group. If you're already a member, you know how it works. But if not, just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field, and it should come right on up. If not, just type the whole name, the Babel Conference. It is a closed group. So if you're joining for the first time, please answer the questions and agree to the rules of the forum so that I can let you in. And you'll find a post for this episode of Warp 5 there on the timeline, and you can share your thoughts with your fellow listeners and Matthew and me right there in the comments. You can also send us email if you like. Just go to our website, trek.fm contact. Use the form you find there, choose to send to a show, and choose Warp 5 
and that will come to Matthew and me by email. And you can find us in social media on Instagram, Twitter, everywhere. Our username is Trek FM. And also, if your podcast app of choice allows you to leave a rating and a review, we would love to get that from you. So please let us know what you think about the show. And that'll help other people also learn about Warp 5 and enjoy Enterprise discussions. Now, Matthew, when you're not stealing clothes off your neighbor's clothesline, where can people find you? Well, uh, I haven't been arrested for that yet, thankfully, but uh, you can find me all over social media under the name Matt Rushing 2 uh, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, Vero, all of those type of places. Of course, you can also find me uh, here on the network with the 602 Club. It's our whole other side of the network. We have so much Star Trek talk. We like to talk about all of the other fandoms we love, so we do that there. And then, of course, you can find me doing Literary Treks, The Orb, The Artificial Tango, and Saddle Up. Literary Treks is about the books and the comics of Star Trek. The Orb, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Chris, you and I love talking about that there. Uh, of course, you can also find us with the Artificial Tango as we're talking about Star Trek Picard. We just finished Season 2. And then um, Saddle Up, as we mentioned, as we're diving into the brand new Star Trek series, Strange New Worlds. And then over on the Nerd Party Network, you'll find me with two shows. One is a completed show did with Dre Kaufman called Owlpost. It was, we talked about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series, one chapter at a time. And then last but not least, I'm over there doing aggressive negotiations with John Mills as we talk about Star Wars each and every week. But Chris, um, when you know, you're know you not trying to figure out which antenna is going to let you watch reruns of I Love Lucy, where can people find you? I've got foil. I'm wrapping it around the antennas right now. <laughs> And I found I found that if I stand exactly five feet and three inches and slightly to the left of the TV, the reception is just almost good enough that I can see the picture. (laughs) When I'm not doing that. Oh, those are the days. Oh, I remember those days so well. When I'm not doing that, you can find me here on the network. As you mentioned, talking with you on the orb, on the artificial tango, saddle up. Larry Nemechek and I do the ready room from time to time. There's Interphase, and I'm in all sorts of shows in the back catalog, including the early years of this show. And check out all of that if you'd like to hear more of my thoughts on Star Trek. And if you'd like to chat with me in social media, my username is C. Brian Jones, the letter C and Brian with a Y. That's my username everywhere in social media, but Twitter is where I'm most active, and I'd love to chat with you there. If you'd like to help us keep Warp 5 and the 602 Club side of the network and everything that we're doing going, we could definitely use your help through Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to find out how. And we want to send a huge thank you to everyone who is supporting us right now. We would not be here without you, so thank you so very, very much. Maybe we'll even invite you to dinner with Captain Archer and trip into pole sometime for a little bit of wine. Well, Matthew, I'm getting ready to not see some Romulans next time as we talk about Minefield. Well, Chris, I I mean, I guess that sounds great. Maybe we should probably cut you off on the wine if you're not (laughs) seeing some Romulans. Uh, But uh, heck, let's go. You get a wonderful story out of it. And speaking of that, Matthew, I before we kick off here, I heard a joke I thought you might really enjoy. Two Vulcans stroll into a bar. Have you heard this and one? <laughs> I, I, uh, I haven't heard that. I'm, I'm ready. I don't know the rest of the joke. Let me, <laughs> let me think of it. But, um, one gets a job and the other figures out the mathematical intricacies of billiards. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just simple geometry. Even a Vulcan child can do it. So, exactly. You know, come on, Chris. Or, or a security officer aboard the Starship Voyager. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs>